Guys, guys, guess what? Come a little closer. Come on. Word on the street is there's a new camera in town. And my gosh, does it have some cool features. You got any idea what it is? I'll tell you after this. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome, welcome, welcome. What an exciting day this is. All night, if you live down here in Australia, we finally have a new camera. After the tiny snippet of a teaser that a home system dropped last year, the forums were abuzz with speculation on what it might be. Is it a new EM1 Mark IV? Perhaps a successor to the EM1X? Or maybe a TG6? Well, it appears home system have been taking things back to the old school with the naming of the new camera as the OM-1. And they've taken things to a whole new level that we've never seen before. So many of you film buffs will know that the name of the infamous film camera is the OM-1. And funnily enough, 2022 marks the 50th anniversary of, what, of when that camera was released. And it's rather fitting that the, being with the new takeover of the company, the camera is once again reborn. What I particularly love is the fact that they've gotten rid of the confusing letter combination of the OMD EM1 Mark III, because that was an absolute nightmare for me trying to remember where the hell the dashes had to go. And you might immediately notice that the camera is, in fact, named Olympus camera, despite the rebranding to OM system. Now, this is a clever move, I think, as quite a few loyal users and new potential customers might be put off by a completely new branded camera body, and is definitely a smoother and less intimidating transition for someone to make if they gradually implement the name on the gear. I mean, we saw this on the new 20mm f1.4, which you can see up here if you haven't caught my review. And of course, you may have seen that the company has also released two new pro lenses, a 12 to 40mm f2.8 Pro Mark II and the 40 to 150mm f4 Pro, both of which will be branded under the OM system logo. So hit that subscribe button if you're keen to see my review of the 40 to 150 lens, as I'll be taking it out and giving my impressions on it very soon. So before we get into the nitty gritty, if you are new to this channel, my name is Matt Horsfall. I'm an OM system ambassador based in Sydney, Australia, and my heart and soul lie in adventure travel and the outdoors. But really, I love all types of photography and believe that practicing and immersing yourself out of your comfort zone makes you a better photographer overall. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, check out some of my other videos on the channel. Okay, so full disclaimer. OM System has paid me to do this review as they know how honest and critical I am with my testings and findings. I also sent them a copy of my notes for the tech guys to uh, fact check, ensure I didn't get any of the specs wrong, uh, but they didn't have any say in the way I portray the camera, my personal opinions, or any of the features, nor influence any of my own personal tests. It's pretty much just all my video. Now, I think it reflects highly on any brand when they ask someone to review an item of this caliber and be totally honest in their findings. Like, if you've seen my 8 to 25 mil review, you will know that everything I mentioned was backed up by real world footage. And that way you can make your own decisions. Of course, there will be some level of bias because, well, I am an ambassador. And honestly, do you think I'll be using the gear if I didn't believe in it? I'd be putting my name and reputation on the line if I talked something up that I didn't believe in or gave false information about. What the camera could do, it just wouldn't make sense. So with that out of the way, I'm going to break up this review into two sections. The first focuses primarily on the stills capabilities of the camera and the overall features. And the second half will focus on the video aspect of things. As usual, I'll leave timestamps so you can go back through after you've watched it in its entirety and re-watch specific parts because undoubtedly you'll have want to watch some more again. Okay, emotion. Now, this is not what you typically find in a camera review, but I really think it's important to mention. And it could be, well, well, it could be one of the most critical aspects of the camera, at least for me. So once the teaser dropped last year, I too was super intrigued. It had been quite a while since a new camera was released. And while the AM1 Mark III was still a capable camera, I felt that I'd squeezed everything I could out of it. Basically, I felt I'd outgrown what the current specs and features offered. Now, I know that's a bit of a defeatist attitude in some respects, but the more experienced I became, the more I began to notice my camera requirements changing. And this was mainly around stills, autofocus capabilities, and my, with my journey into video. So as many as you know, I 
Absolutely love my Blackmagic cameras. The image quality and workflow can't be beaten for the price. But there were many times on adventures and other commercial shoots where I needed a rugged, weather-sealed camera capable of better quality video codecs. So a few weeks before I received my copy of the camera for this review, I still knew nothing about the specs and features. And it made me a little bit nervous. So why, you might ask? Well, somewhere deep down inside me, there was a little voice of doubt asking if the camera doesn't live up to the public, what if the camera doesn't live up to public expectations? What if the camera doesn't tick those boxes for what I'm craving for my commercial work? What if, what if, what if? I then received the spec sheet a week before the unit arrived and instantly became excited. It was clear that OM System had thrown a ton of R&D into this design and was sporting new tech and drastically upgraded features that we'd all been asking for. The question is, would it deliver out in the real world? So I then spent hours going over the spec sheets, making notes of how I could test the camera's new features across demanding situations on a variety of shoots. So my pre-production unit then arrived in the mail and I was more excited than a schoolgirl at a Justin Bieber concert. I mean, here I had this camera in my hand that many people were saying could make or break the brand. And I was one of the first to absolutely punish it. So I quickly planned out three unique shoots that would serve as a backbone of my review findings. The first was a canyoning trip where the camera's weather sealing, low light, performance, IS, and image quality could be tested. The second was a blustery cold wet portrait shoot that would test the camera's autofocus tracking, improve dynamic range, burst modes, and low light performance. And the third was a city night shoot that would test the camera's improved AI comp modes, low light performance, and IS. So actually two of these shoots will be actually released as a dedicated BTS shoot video over the coming weeks. So if you were keen on watching those, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, hit that bell so you know, you'll be the first to know. So with the canyoning trip, I decided to venture back to a place where I captured some of my personal favorite images a few years back. Uh, and I immediately loved how fast the camera would lock on focus and the vastly improved rescreen and EVF. The speed at which everything happened was mind blowing to say the least. However, it wasn't until the portrait shoot with my good friend Lisa, the true potential of the camera really hit me for six. I mean, it's seriously been quite a while since I felt so excited and free on a shoot where I literally felt like nothing was limiting my creativity. Like I felt so confident I could do anything, the camera could do anything I asked of it, and just have to have fun. And the weather had bouts of downpour, we shot scenes with a lot of fast movement, and I shot through different thicknesses of foliage, not to mention some incredibly contrasty and backlit scenes and the camera didn't skip a beat. And the sheer number of usable shots to unusable was pretty staggering, which you'll see in the BTS scenes. Like seriously, I felt a buzz like I'd never felt in a long time. Like I'm so excited to use this camera across my commercial shoots, as I honestly think the new specs have brought it in line with my current needs. And I'm confident this camera will be even better with future updates. So I guess this was a super long-winded way of saying that people often get caught up in the specs and the latest and greatest tech. I mean, I for one am super guilty of that. I've got absolute bucket loads of camera gear. But this camera not only features some incredible specs, it actually excites me and enables me to go out and push my cre creativity even more. And this is really targeted to those run and gun creators who just need to get shit done, basically. So enough of the deep emotional stuff, Matt. I know you guys want to see what the camera can do. So let's get into it. So what's in the box? Now I'm not really one for doing unboxing videos, but when you're gonna be paying this much for something, it's worth mentioning what you actually get for your money. So let's have a look. So inside the box, well, remember it's a pre-production model, so I did get everything, uh, the manual, but I did get all of the other things, so nice little box. So inside we get our power charger, uh, a USB-C cable, um, because it is chargeable by USB-C, we'll get through that soon. We get the, the little flash unit that comes with most of the other cameras and I never really used it. Uh, the power cable, we're Australian here. A nice little uh, soft bag that I guess you could clean the lens with, keep some stuff inside. Our new shoulder strap that has Olympus and OM system written on it. Leather on the back, material in the front. So I apologize as well, uh, it's starting to bucket rain the white noise from my uh, six month old's uh, white noise machine is also playing and she probably will cry. So I apologize if the sound is getting uh, a little bit noisy. We also have the cable um, gatherer to help prevent cables from coming out and the uh, USB-C and micro HDMI port clamp. I'll go over that a bit later. And we have 
just the bag that the camera came in. So you will get a, a manual. I didn't get it because it wasn't out at the time. So specs and features. So I'm assuming you've already visited the OM system page and read through the new features and specs that the OM1 contains. So it'd be pointless for me to go through and list everything here. But what I will do though is put up the key features that I think stand out against the competition and also those that are a significant upgrade from the previous models. And we'll do a deeper dive into these features later on in the video. So I'll put the specs up now so you can press pause and read over them. So some of the accessories that are also been released is the new battery holder. Uh, a dual battery uh, battery holder grip, the dual battery charger with indicators, uh, a new wireless remote which is uh, currently only compatible with the OM1. It is compatible as a wide remote with the M1 Mark II, III, M1X and the M5 Mark III as they've got that 2.5 mini jack. Uh, but all other cameras will not be compatible with the remote. There is a new eye cup which we'll go over later um, that you can purchase. The cable protector which is included and sold separately. As you'd expect, the OM1 is compatible with all previous accessories like the flash units. Some of the extra things are OM Image Share. Uh, the app wouldn't work at the moment, but it is going to be working when this is released. Uh, OM Workspace version 2 with AI noise reduction and OM Capture version 3, so you can use this in the studio. So there are, of course, many other minor specs that I didn't list here. So I urge you to head over to the OM System website to check these out further. Okay, build and ergonomics. Okay, so build and ergonomics. So as a man with small hands, but an enormous heart, I never found the other EM1 models to be particularly cumbersome to use or difficult to hold or operate in any way. I did find the grip on the EM1X to be a tad too deep for my little hands uh, when single hand holding. And I sometimes need to use two hands to shoot with longer lenses. Uh, and the EM1 Mark III did feel light and pleasant in my hand. It was a tad rigid in how the body was molded. Uh, being a back button focus user, the position of the auto exposure button was a bit too far to the top and made my hands reach across, but perks of having small hands, I guess. So with the OM1, OM system has basically placed it between the EM1 Mark III and the EM1X in size, of, in size and ergonomics. However, it was only slightly larger than the EM1 Mark III. Uh, it was just pretty impressive considering what they've packed inside. So the grip is super deep, but not too thick. And I can hold this camera much tighter than the M1X, which makes using longer lenses like the 40 to 150 and the 300 mm Pro to be much more comfortable. There is less now less downward pressure on my fingers uh, as I have a much so more solid grip. Uh, the body is also uh, more curvy in finger placement regions that position your fingers exactly where they should be. Uh, and I think this is particularly noticeable in the right thumb region at the back here. Uh, where the autofocus on and autofocus joystick is found. There is zero need to reach up or extend my thumb now, resulting in faster and less tiring back button focusing sessions. The right index finger scroll dial is now recessed into the body, like the M1X, which helps prevent the dial's accidental turning, which could happen when the camera brushes against your body. Uh, the top left side buttons are now concaved in rather than concaved out, uh, which takes some getting used to as uh, the tiny outer ridge has been put there to stop unwanted activation of the buttons. Um, but after a full day of shooting the camera, I don't notice it anymore, and it is a welcome addition to the design. Body texture looks almost identical to the M1 range, but feels slightly stickier and more tactile than before. I'm unsure if this is actually the case, or I've just worn the grippiness off the other cameras. Button-wise, it's almost identical to the M1 Mark III, apart from the new autofocus on button and the eye cup is an entirely new design that is deeper and softer than previous models and houses the new EVF along with separate sensors for the automatic proximity sensor which was housed within the same EVF glass on the other models. So the rear LCD design is pretty much identical to previous models as well. And still the actual screen panel is now, now narrower taking up the avoided space on the left side of the panel that was seen in the earlier models. However, the actual working LCD is still three inches in size, which is subtle yet a terrific refinement. Inside the SD card holder, you now find two ultra high speed two card slots compared to the one on the M1 Mark III and allows you to dual write to both cards insanely quickly for the high speed burst modes. At the base, you'll find the same recessed lever style release for the battery compartment where the new BLX1 battery is housed. 
uh, OM system state, you should get about 520 shots out of this battery, which is about a 20% increase on previous models. I am unsure of whether this is true as I've been using it as a mixture of stills and video, along with the live ND and high res modes, which obviously drain the battery faster. So during the canyoning trip, I shot almost every five minutes, I'd say, over an eight hour day. I only went through one and a half batteries, which is pretty impressive. I was also being highly conservative that day as I wasn't sure how long they'd last. Uh, the beauty of this camera though is you can now power it with a power bank and shoot simultaneously, which is what I'm doing now. Alright, weather sealing. It would be rude to think that the OM1 is anything short of an absolute beast when it comes to weather sealing. Like, I mean, it's one of the standout features of the brand, I'd say, that no one can really argue with. If you've been following my Olympus journey over the past few years, you would know that I absolutely punish my cameras. Like, who would be crazy enough to shoot an entire week of Holly Festival using no protection from the water, fine dust and sludge? Me with my insurance. <laughs> but uh, having absolute confidence in my gear is a must. So when shooting in less than ideal conditions, I never once found the camera faulted when it got wet. The OM1 features an incredible IP53 rating, which is pretty much dust proof and splash proof and probably the best in the world. So the actual rating suggests IP53 is protected from limited dust ingress and water spray less than 90 deg 60 degrees from vertical. I think this is a bit conservative still. I know Marines recommend you put the camera through anything beyond the specified rating. This is just my personal experience and what I'm willing to do. So there really is very little more than to say about the weather ceiling beyond that is nothing short of incredible and built for adventure. Like when, the, when canyoning, the humidity and constant water falling on the camera and lens did nothing to deter me from capturing these images. My mates who shoot with another leading brand kept their cameras inside their bag and even decided to borrow one of my cameras in the future for trips like this. Basically, they were blown away. For reference though, to gain full IP53 of the entire system, OM system state that you must use uh, the lenses that I'll put up here somewhere. So continuing on with hardware improvements, the OM1 features a brand new OLED EVF sporting 5.76 million dots of res, a magnification of 1.65 times, anti-fog encoding, and is capable of 120 frames a second blackout free. It's undoubtedly a significant upgrade from the previous models. With richer contrast, higher frame rates, there isn't even an option inside the menu system to turn on high frame rate mode. However, I found the regular mode to be more than enough. And I'm unclear as to what the standard frame rate mode is as I assume that the frame rate, the high one is 120 frames a second. So I have to be honest, I found myself using the rear LCD for about 90% of my shooting these days. Not just with this camera, but for any camera. I guess I've just gotten used to it from using my large bright screen on my cinema cameras. Uh, also I love having my peripheral vision uninhibited so I can move safely around and, and, and recompose my scene without being limited to a, to a single window. That being said, the EVF is magnificent on the OM1 and offers a very sharp and true to life picture, bringing it in line with current standard of EVFs out there today. Although the exact size is unknown, the new EVF is more prominent than before uh, than we've seen in previous models. And you have the option to customize what is seen inside the EVF with three different toolbar layout options and the ability to cycle through multiple preset information readings like exposure warnings, battery readings, uh, and everything else. So a previous feature called Live View Boost has now been renamed in the OM1 as Night View Mode, which, when engaged, works some kind of low light magic and increases your ability to compose very dark scenes. So I tested this out in my office, turned off all the lights, closed the blinds, and with the Night View turned off, I could make out faint out outlines of the objects, and the LCD and EVF looked quite noisy, which was to be expected. But with night mode turned on, or night view turned on, the scene was instantly more recognizable. Uh, from my tests, it seems that the camera is boosting the gain while applying heavy noise reduction. So you can easily make out uh, and focus on your subject. So this is only a monitoring feature and will not be recorded on your final image. And one thing to note here is that you can only use night view mode in the single autofocus mode, manual and starry sky autofocus. This is a small but handy feature for landscape and low light shooters and saves you getting your phone out and using it as a torch to, to try and set focus. So as mentioned before, the three inch 270 degree swivel LCD has the same viewing space as previous models, but is much brighter and richer in picture. 
The refresh rate also improved, uh, has been improved, as is the brightness, but I couldn't find any hard specs on what that would be. Uh, I didn't find shooting in bright daylight much of an issue uh, beyond the usual glare that you get from uh, a shiny screen. The touch responsiveness is quite good, and the menus load almost instantly when you press them. Uh, when reviewing your images, you can now set star ratings within the playback mode. So it's pretty handy and cuts down a lot of post-production culling time. It's even better that these ratings are automatically readable in Lightroom, which wasn't available before. So the layout of the, the rear LCD has also got, undergone a refresh. And it only took me a few hours to get used to locating info that I wanted to see. So there are numerous options to change what is viewable on the screen. However, I wish there was an option to move or snap items to different areas of the screen, like the histogram, which annoyingly floats randomly on the top left third of the screen. Like, I'd rather this be located somewhere on the peripheries and not impede my view. So if you'd like me to do a video on my favorite or recommended settings for the OM1, drop me a comment below because I might do one of those soon. Menus. So OM system has completely redesigned the menu system on the OM1. It is based on the horizontal layout rather than the cluttered vertical layout of the previous models. And this horizontal layout fits the right thumb and index finger dials way more naturally, which are also horizontal, meaning the movements between them are fluid and fast between the folders. So this menu style also feels pretty good to me because I've been shooting black magic and their horizontal system has been renowned as being one of the best. So I think OM system has done an excellent job in the way that they've implemented this. Uh, scrolling with your right index finger quickly moves across the main setting groups, uh, which are still shooting menu, computational and other still space options, autofocus options, video playback operation settings, and my favorite of all, the my settings. So of course it will take some time to get used to locating the items if you're used to the previous layouts, but honestly it's so intuitive now that it won't take long to nail it. One thing to note is that the menu options cannot be accessed by the touch screen, nor can you scroll or switch between groups, which can be a bit frustrating. For ultimate speed though, you're best creating your own uh, most used features and settings and putting them in your own menu. This will also help someone who has never used the camera before uh, access and change settings without difficulty, which I often do. So many of the features within the menu system display an info sentence below and tells the user what the setting is actually doing. However, some of the obscure settings simply say on or off, with no information of what they actually do. While you can look it up in the manual, it would be nice to have the option to turn on or off info for each setting, and actually have the information for every single option, not just a select few. Okay, sensor. So of course, the standout inclusion in the OM1 is the brand spanking new backside illuminated stack CMOS sensor. OM system would have been mad not to upgrade this sensor. And honestly, a 20 megapixel is still more than enough resolution for 90% of the shooters out there. I'm actually happy that it's 20 megapixel and nothing more. File sizes are smaller, we have better low light gathering abilities, and with the AI high res modes at the press of a button, I really don't find myself at any disadvantage. So I found that the image quality is outstanding, the skin tones are great. It'll take a good few months, I think, of shooting and editing before comparing image quality between the models. But honestly, I think that the image quality of the early models was already outstanding, so improvements here can only be a bonus. While I rarely shoot JPEG, I did set the camera to JPEG RAW, uh, just to see the colors in the natural setting. And I was happy with the results. The colors looked true to life and weren't overly saturated on my pro calibrated Adobe RGB monitor. They were pretty good. So OM system claims an increase of two stop noise performance and one stop dynamic range over its predecessor, which I think is pretty impressive. And from my technical test, non-technical test, sorry, I have noticed marked improvements on what I can pull back in post and how well noise is controlled at about ISO 6400. There's also something different in the way that uh, noise is rendered. It just, it looks a bit more grainish rather than actually noise, whether it's the color, uh, noise is controlled better, I'm unsure. Still at ISO 3200, there is a little bit of noise when viewed on my 32 inch 4K monitor. But uh, if you're just viewing it on your MacBook Pro or your phone, you'll be hard pressed to see any of it. And with just a slight uh, noise reduction in Lightroom, you can pretty much just eliminate most of it. Uh, and if you wanna go one step further, you can use Topaz and you can remove it all. Uh, you can see here some of the images shot at ISO 3200. But I will show you a comparison test in the high res mode section, so you can be sure to check that out and see for yourself. 
So I must point out that I did edit my images using Lightroom after exporting them as TIFFs um, from OM Workspace because all my presets and I'm just used to the speed of Lightroom, so I just use that. Uh, so I shouldn't have lost too much detail exporting them as TIFFs, but there's a chance that there could be a slight um, swaying quality and the prevalence of noise and color shifts. So Lightroom has already added support for the OM-1 as, as a recognizable camera. So by the time that you uh, see this, it will be ready for Lightroom. So backside illuminated sensors are known for the increased image quality and light gathering abilities. The light doesn't have to pass through the circuitry to get to the photo sites now. So this improvement in sensor performance is a significant upgrade for Micro Four Thirds cameras, as they are traditionally not known for ultra low light shooting, and I have noticed a marked improvement. So like with every new iteration of flagship cameras, a new processor is also implemented in the design. And this time we have the TruePic 10, which promises three times the speed of the nine with 120 frames a second readout. And that is impressive considering how fast the TruePic 9 was. So you'll see later on in the comp modes um, just how quick this processor uh, renders everything. Seriously, it's so damn fast. Autofocus. So to me, the standout feature of the OM-1 is its blazing fast new autofocus system with its quad pixel, 1053 point, all cross type face detection system that covers 100% of the image area and can focus down to negative ADV. Seems nothing can escape being tack sharp. And from what I can tell, the OM-1 is the first production camera out there to actually use quad pixel autofocus system at the time of its release. So dual pixel autofocus features in some of the top models out there at the moment and is undoubtedly incredibly fast. And I'm certainly no expert on this in, because I'm just not a techie. But from my research I've deduced, the dual pixel autofocus works by uh, splitting each pixel into two photo diodes. The camera then analyzes both these images at once to determine how to focus the lens forward or backwards and how closely it's locked on focus. But unfortunately, when your scene has lines running perpendicular to the front of the face of the sensor, both pixels see that image um, as pretty much the same thing. So with quad pixel autofocus, it should fix this by not only providing extra pixels for comparison in a second axis, but also diagonally in either direction. So if you'd like to learn more about this, there are some great articles online which I kind of read up on. All you need to know though, is we've got some insanely impressive autofocus tech inside this camera and it blows me away. So most of my compositions were relatively static during the Canyon shoot and I pretty much only used single point autofocus to hone in on my mate Sam. Though I think the only time I missed focus in this scenario was when I stupidly forgot to change the manual clutch, which I have done so many times. By default, the rear cross pad has been disabled. So instead of moving the focus points to another position, um, it's done purely by the joystick now. And this took some getting used to at first as I had always defaulted to the cross pad on the AM1 Mark III, despite featuring the joystick. As with previous models, you can still tap to focus using the rear LCD, which worked well, except when my hands were wet, but that's to be expected. The face and eye detection improvements on the OM-1 are nothing short of amazing. The EM-1 Mark III was, was good, but sometimes it could be a tad slow to lock on and during dimly lit situations like a wedding reception, the face detection was pretty much useless, I'm sorry. But with the OM-1, it finds the face and eye incredibly fast and it instills a lot of confidence in capturing low light action shots. And I can't wait to use it more. So during the portrait shoot, I used a variety of autofocus modes and focus patterns depending on the movement I was aiming for. Uh, it usually used around the small three by three or single point when the scene became busy to ensure that it found the subject's face. But, but this time I almost always left it at um, the large grid setting or all when the, um, when the movements became erratic. And I was actually blown away at how many usable shots I got uh, while running and spinning around and, and it found Lisa's face almost every time. So for these shots uh, of Lisa, I purposely shot with foliage in the foreground. Uh, I kept the autofocus system set to large and even with leaves and branches in front of the lens, it locked onto a face, like something not possible in previous models. So this is the stuff that excites me because for instance, when this rainbow appeared, we had like 30 seconds before it was gone. Like I had no time to make setting changes or find the perfect composition. I was already standing behind this bush. So I shot from there. And the camera seemed to just know what I wanted and it locked onto her eyes every time. One thing to note here is though that 
When face and eye detection is turned on, the white focus box will show up on any face and eye the camera detects. Even if you've only set the grid to small and you're using it in different parts of the scene, it will always lock on to the, the first face it detects as well. There is an option to turn off the eye detection frame, but I prefer to leave this on so I know the camera is focused on the correct eye. There is also an option to turn the autofocus area pointer to a green target frame rather than just the box frame, which I find super helpful. This basically displays lots of tiny little green autofocus boxes over the exact area that the camera is focusing on uh, when using continuous or continuous tracking modes. And it's nice to visually see the camera adapting to the changing distances and movements of the subject in real time. So as with previous M1 models, there are a variety of autofocus point combinations to choose from. And each is now labeled at the top of the screen as you cycle through them with the dial. So by default, you must first press or move the joystick to activate these choices. The cross pad won't work. These options are labeled single point, small, medium, and large, and full. So you can see the differences here and what OM system recommend each is used for. I have found the face detection is so good that I would basically just leave it at large or full when shooting a single person. I do wish that there was an option to turn on the autofocus grid to see exactly where the next autofocus box is going to be placed. Like This is particularly useful when using single point autofocus on small objects moving just slightly. Olympus users would be familiar with the see-through grid on the LCD or EVF when moving autofocus points. With this though, uh, it's just a box floating around the screen. Having full coverage is also incredibly helpful when you simply cannot physically move the camera or change to a wider lens. Uh, so that the subject is closer to the center and the workable autofocus points. However, even though OM1, OM systems state that there is 100% coverage, when moving the single point autofocus to the peripheries of the screen, you will notice that it doesn't quite reach. But when switching to small focus point, it sits right against the edge. So it definitely does reach the edge. But honestly though, there's very rarely a time that you'll use um, a point that's so close to the edge. So after some testing of my own and further consultation with OM system, I found that the, using the continuous autofocus tracking modes in stills and videos kind of works best when you use a narrower a box and lock onto the subject and then let it move around the screen um, rather than using the full and letting it track. I'm unsure why, but it does work better that way. So with a bit of practice, it should be pretty easy and, and only require you to move the camera slightly to align the subject within the box. We also have a new addition to the AI subject tracking found on those, uh, on top of those found on the M1X with the inclusion of dogs and cats. So I didn't get a chance to test this at all. I'm, I'm sure it worked really well. I saw the demonstration from Olympus and uh, OM system and it worked great. And I hope that this detection is also transferable to other four-legged animals because there's plenty out there. So as with the M1X, you can still track your cars, trains, boats, and planes but they state that it's about two times more accurate and three times faster, which I think is pretty impressive. And through my testing of the car tracking mode, I found the camera was super fast at identifying most of the cars within the frame and it would lock on instantly. But uh, when there were many, many cars within the frame box, sometimes it would jump to another one, but turning the sensitivity down did help alleviate this. Burst modes. So now that we've covered the autofocus system, it is only natural that we talk about the different burst modes on the OM-1, and they are great. So with the new processor has unlocked a mighty improvement to the already class-leading high-speed burst modes. So in addition to the familiar mechanical and electronic and pro capture burst modes, the camera now features additional modes called SH-1, SH-2, Pro SH-1, and Pro SH-2. So the camera is capable of 50 frames a second, 96 raw high speed sequential shooting during autofocus, auto exposure, intelligent subject tracking when using SH2 and Pro Capture SH2. And that uses the electronic shutter. So there's pretty much no chance of missing the target. That's a huge increase from the 18 frames a second on the previous models, and they didn't even include tracking. So in SH1 and Pro Capture SH1, you get 120 frames a second, 92 raw with full lock. So those of you shooting water boat bursts or, or other fast movements when I mean, the subject isn't moving erratically, you can capture some incredible shots. That is with single though. I would also point out that with all SH modes, they shoot blackout free and you can still use the blackout free handheld assist, which we'll go over soon. 
So for those of you who are new to Pro Capture, basically the camera is pre-buffering a set amount of images uh, while ever you half press the shutter button. So once you fully press it, the camera takes a set amount of frames afterwards, uh, ensuring that if your finger is too slow to shoot the movement, the camera will have already captured it within the buffer. It's pretty crazy. Now with the OM1, you have this little slider here that visually shows how many pre-frames are captured and how many post shutter release has been captured. So you can see here, I've set the limited to 99, but it actually defaults to 50. So you can set it however you want. With both SH2 modes, the minimum shutter speed is 1 640th of a second. So you'll need a bit of light uh, or crank up that ISO to accommodate this. But luckily when you half press the shutter, you get a live view of the exposure and can adjust accordingly. So you know exactly what you need to have. So when shooting bursts like these, you'll obviously want to use super fast high capacity cards and I'll leave a link below to the ones that I recommend because uh, they are different and they cost vastly different amounts of money. So these upgrades are pretty amazing for anyone who shoots wildlife or for shooters capturing split second moments like in sport or um, anything that moves quick and they can't be repeated. But for me, most of the day when I'm just shooting general stuff or like weddings or events or, or people, just my friends out in, in the wild, 20 frames a second of the, the regular high speed burst or low speed is pretty much all I will need. But I am keen to try out the SH1 and SH2 modes uh, on some wildlife. And before we move on, there are a list of autofocus and auto exposure 50 frames a second compatible lenses, which I'll put up on the screen now for you to have a look at. Uh, any of the other lenses pretty much won't work. They'll be limited to uh, 25 frames a second sequential shooting, which is still incredibly fast. Uh, and, but there are three lenses where the SH2 mode will not be compatible at all and will default to approximately 13 frames a second um, mechanical and 20 frames silent sequential. But again, that's still incredibly fast. Alrighty, stabilization. So perhaps another feature that Olympus has pioneered and led the way in was the creation and implementation of internal stabilization. And in particular, the world-class five axis units that were featured in previous EM1 models or EM5 as well, EM10. So if you follow along with my previous work, you know that I am comfortably handheld exposures of five seconds or more, uh, negating the use of a tripod, which is pretty cool. Uh, like the EM1 Mark II and EM1X, the OM1 features up to seven stops of stabilization with the body alone, and eight of um, IBIS paired with a lens like the 150 to 400. And while one may think you, with the new flag, flagship camera that the stabilization rating might have been improved, it hasn't really in terms of um, stops, but it doesn't really need to because it's so damn good. And with the OM1, IS even works within the bulb modes. So opening up handheld live composite exposures possibilities is pretty cool. I am yet to test this out, but I think you need some pretty steady hands and fast moving light painting for this to be quite effective. So when you half press the shutter and stills mode, for those who haven't used an Olympus or OM system camera, you actually hear the stabilization working inside the camera. It's almost like a dull shh. And when paired with a lens like the 300mm f4 Pro that also features stabilization, you will be blown away at how steady the shots are. The micro jitters are pretty much smoothed out. So like the previous models, we get four flavors of stills, image stabilization and auto, and all direction, a horizontal and a vertical only. So the horizontal and vertical are quite handy when performing panning shots, like if you're tracking a car or something or a wildlife, and it's something I've used a bit on the M1 Mark III. So for those of you who are wondering what mode I use the most, I typically leave it on auto because I find it just works so well uh, and there's not really any need to change it. So of course not everyone will be able to pick up one of these cameras and get five second exposures straight off the bat. No, there's still a lot of practice and skill involved uh, along with some sneaky little tips and tricks that can make all the difference. Uh, if you'd like me to do a video on something like that, leave a comment below and, uh, and I might do a short one. The OM1 does, however, contain a very handy little feature called Handheld Assist. So what Handheld Assist does is it displays a square in the middle of the screen with a little marker in the center. And once you half press the shutter, the idea is to keep the tiny little dot as close to the center of the box as possible for the duration of the exposure. So OM system state you should get up to one stop of stabilization using this feature. I like to think of it as a super simple little game you might have found like an old Nokia phone, a bit like Snake. While it's not only addictive and fun to use, it actually drastically helps your handheld long exposures. And we now have a visual reference to focus on rather than just guessing. 
So I'll cover the camera stabilization when shooting video in the video section. So make sure you stick around for that. All right, computational modes. So over the past three or so years, Olympus has really pushed the AI and computational modes inside their cameras. Indeed, they pioneered the high-res modes that are now found on other brands. And if you ask me, they're still at the top of the game in this area. So back in 2019, when I took the EM1X to Holly Festival, I used the handheld high-res mode quite a bit. Uh, still, being a millennial, I often got frustrated with the time it took to stack the images. Hence, the feature never really made it into my fast workflow in further shoots. It also required a couple more steps to turn on and off. So this is okay if you're shooting landscapes or casually strolling around while traveling. But I tend to work fast and waiting 10 seconds each time uh, I wanted to use it would definitely add up. But now with the OM1 has come along and not only has it been improved, the processing speed is enormously faster and they made accessing the mode even quicker. So by default, you only have to press the red record button, which also features the high res symbol next to it. And the chosen handheld or tripod mode is turned on. So what's even better is that the handheld assist also works within this mode without blackout making longer exposure high res shots possible. So this took me around five goes to now with a shutter of half a second as the camera takes 12, se 12 separate half second exposures and stacking them in this scenario. So one of the beauties of the both modes is that you can get away with higher ISO shooting as noise becomes way more suppressed during the stacking process. I did find that there was still a little bit of noise at ISO 3200 using the handheld mode uh, when using this mode in situations during the day though, I like to set my ISO around 800 or so and the shutter captures the sequence almost instantly. And, and an ISO 800, there's pretty much zero noise. Uh, but you can see here on that 3200 uh, ISO handheld high res shot I took at night, uh, some of the noise. So I can definitely see myself using this mode now out in the field as it's much more acceptable speed. Like the guys who helped me out with these shoots uh, in the canyon were also quite blown away at the speed, detail and noise suppression of this mode. And they even commented on, on the drive home just how impressive the feature was and the overall speed of the camera. I actually got Sam to take a photo of me for this shot and I simply told him, hold the camera steady and keep the little dot at the center of the frame. It couldn't be easier. Holy shit. The high-res tripod mode has also been given a speed boost and offers 80 megapixel images like before, which is insane. You of course need to carry a tripod with you or support the camera on something steady. And this mode processes quicker than the handheld mode, I think, because the camera doesn't have to process the stabilization data on top of the image stacking, just the images themselves. But you do have to carry a tripod. So a minor yet crazy feature added to the OM1 is shooting time lapses using the high res tripod mode. So while you cannot output a direct video from the camera like you can in the regular interval mode, you can capture a time lapse of 80 megapixel raw images to stitch in editing programs later. And that will give you 8K footage. Drop a comment below because I'm keen to try that out if you'd like to see what a time lapse looks like in 8K from this camera. So every iteration of the high res mode that Olympus have put into their cameras gets better and better, uh, particularly when objects are moving in scenes like uh, swinging leaves or people moving because the camera is stacking 12 images on top of each other. So any movement between the shots has to be blended and can cause unnatural looking blurring. Shooting with a higher shutter speed of more than like a thousandth of a second can certainly help. Uh, I tested the tripod mode with a slight breeze on some branches here and even at eight thousandth of a second there was some blurring when using the tripod mode. And the camera will often spit out an ORI file with the JPEG and RAW. So this is a separate file with slightly lower resolution than 80 megapixel. It should be sharper as the camera has applied AI to try and account for that movement. So if you actually rename the ORI file to .orf, it should be readable in Lightroom. And you probably get a usable photo there. So using handheld high res 
Uh, definitely improves the movement blending, but I would need to ask the OM system techs about why that is. So, it is important to note that Olympus nor OM system has ever marketed this feature though to be applicable on moving subjects. It is definitely better for landscapes or subjects with very little motion or perhaps a stream that everything else is static. So notice the benefit of using OM workspace in this regard is that it automatically displays a symbol on the images telling you that this is a high res image. And it also tells you which high res mode you shot with in the information. It would be awesome if uh, this was featured in Lightroom, but I think it's highly unlikely. Okay, Live ND. So Live ND is one of those features that still blows my mind every time I use it. And while the Olympus R&D team um, for the EMI, E1X undoubtedly planned this for just to be used in landscapes and waterfalls, I was pretty much never one to stick to the rules and I kept thinking, how else can I use it? Uh, so I used it to capture scenes like this in Holy Festival. And this shot was actually featured in Nat Geo as one of the top colorful places in the world. So it proves that it can be used differently. So the only one now features an ND64, which is a six stop um, ND filter, meaning you can shoot in much brighter conditions than previously. And the handheld uh, assist also works in this mode, so you can go even longer. So like previous versions, the live ND works best for subjects moving, moving at a relatively fast pace. Because it stacks a lot of images together, um, slow moving objects don't always appear to, uh, to blend smoothly because their speed might vary. Uh, so I showed the guys how this feature worked on this waterfall when we were canyoning and they were blown away at seeing the exposure built, build up on the screen. It was like magic. So I did have a quick play with this feature during my shoot with Lisa as well where I got her to jog across the rocks while I blurred her motion, but I didn't get to play with it anymore after that. Okay, Live Composite. Another AI feature that I absolutely love is the Live Composite mode. And I've used this quite a few times since its inception on the M1 Mark II capturing star trails in a single raw file with great success. Uh, this is the, one of those modes that many light painters use as it makes the workflow incredibly straightforward. Everything just builds on the screen. And it's actually fun watching the scene on the back of the camera, uh, but it can also be frustrating when you see something you didn't plan for about to enter the scene like a plane or person, um, because you know that it's going to uh, Im impact the, the raw file. But having that single raw file definitely cuts down on the post-production process. So if you can eliminate all of those distractions coming in, it's beautiful. So live composite in the OM1 has now been increased to a six hour maximum time limit, meaning that there is more than enough time for super long star trails. But this is obviously depend on your battery level and outside temp, because if it's cold, your battery will drain quicker. So the applications of live composite are endless, and I've even used it when photographing real estate, as you can pop lights into parts of the scene at a low level to see if build up on the screen. So you just keep at popping a little bit of uh, flash or lighting uh, to adjust to your taste. Really though, night exposures are where the magic happens. Uh, and I shot this image of the Sydney Harbour Bridge where the passing cars and trucks were shaking the tripod quite a bit. The first image is without IBIS turned on, and the second was with it, so it's incredible that all of this tech just works together seamlessly and fast. Focus stacking. So Olympic, Olympus cameras are widely used in the macro and landscape photography realm due to their size and advantage of having a more comprehensive depth of field, straight off the bat. So I've seen phenomenal macro shots taken by amateurs and enthusiasts using these cameras. And their focus, Olympus focus stacking um, and bracketing abilities are super quick. So with the focus stacking, the camera shifts the focal position to capture and, and composite multiple shots across a set of set number of focal plane positions. So on the all in one that can be set between three and 15 different images. The camera then combines these into one com composite JPEG along with what, uh, all the raw files you can process in OM workspace or Lightroom. I just wish that it would output one raw file for me so I've got more latitude in post-production. But thanks to the new processor, I found this mode to be incredibly quick uh, at spitting out the JPEG and raw. With my testing of this mode, I did find that when stacking a series of shots along a surface that was almost perpendicular to the lens, um, the stacking preview showed parts of the image in focus, yet the picture didn't show those areas in focus in the JPEG that was spat out. Once I increased the angle of the lens, uh, the resulting like shooting down, the JPEG looked sh tack sharp front to back. And I'm not no macro photographer, so I was definitely doing something wrong. So if you've got any tips, please leave them in the comments below because I'd love to learn from you. So the focus bracketing mode can be found in a different section of the menu system. 
Now it isn't technically a computational mode, instead it's rather just a large series of raw images bracketed at minute focal plane changes. And these changes can be then processed you know, in Workspace or another editing program. And with this model you can shoot up to a staggering 999 photos, that is a lot of depth. Another non-AI mode that I use on occasion is the fisheye compensation mode. Now I love the tiny 8mm Pro fisheye, but with the extreme nature of the distortion it can only be used in a few applications. Previous models featured a, a, a set of algorithms to compensate for the distortion, showing you a live view of what the rectilinear lens would look like. OM1 features the same mode, and it works brilliantly except that your RAW file still contains fisheye distortion and only the JPEGs corrected. I wish you could have the RAW. Now when you also process that image in OM Workspace, there's a checkbox to automatically compensate for the distortion on the raw file, but it does such a poor job compared to the camera that it's pretty much unusable. Which is a shame, as you can get some insanely wild shots using this lens, and not having to manually try and fix it in post would be a huge benefit. There are of course many other features of this camera that I would love to have tested and talked to you about, but with time constraints, absolutely shocking weather, COVID, and my six month old baby, it just wasn't possible to try everything and get it all filmed in time for the launch, so I'm sorry. But please do drop me a comment if there's anything in particular that I didn't cover that you'd like me to test, or perhaps you have a question about the camera and its stills capabilities, because I'll be more than happy to, uh, to give you my thoughts. All right, on to video. So perhaps the most nerve-wracking specs that I was excited yet scared to learn about were the camera's video capabilities. Having heavily invested in video content production over the past year, it quickly became apparent that while producing beautiful video content straight off the bat out of the camera, the Olympus system required almost uh, optimal lighting conditions and very delicate colour grading to be used in a commercial production. I'm not saying it couldn't be done, but it was just a bit more delicate. So I loved the picture that came from this, uh, the Cinema 4K, even though it was 8-bit and limited to 24p, but found the Ultra HD modes to be overly sharp and mobile phone-like, requiring the use of a 1-8th uh, mist filter to soften things up. When the EM1 Mark II was released, it was an absolute game-changer in the camera industry, and it was what we took to Cent uh, Central Asia for our Olympus Vision project. And I actually put together a short film with clips we took from that project, which you can watch up here. So that was the first time I'd ever filmed anything, so we had a lot to learn, but it was a thrilling camera to film with, especially for a beginner filmmaker, as the IBIS, the size and weather ceiling meant we could shoot wherever, whenever, and we didn't have to really worry about it. Um, it was, we had no limitations, basically. And when you expose right, the image is fantastic. I mean, I was blown away by Yane Amune's uh, trailer clip they shot with the M1X and Chrissy Walker's film Dreamwalkers. Like, both of these were shot internally, not using ProRes RAW. However, while the video uh, features of these cameras were terrific at the time of release, and, and still more, en more than enough for people starting out in their filmmaking journey, technology has moved on at a rapid pace, and video content is more highly sought after than the stills imagery in commercial work, it seems. Just look at TikTok and Instagram. So higher frame rates, 10-bit footage, and options for shooting various codecs are all features that even prosumer level hybrid cameras feature these days. So OM system would have shot themselves in the foot if they didn't upgrade the video capabilities in their new release. So I spent hours reading over and rereading the spec sheets and playing around with footage in DaVinci Resolve, and I must say I love what the OM1 is offering so far. The image isn't overly sharp and it has a nice filmic look to it. In fact, this review has been filmed on the camera right now. So I'll pop up the main specs here that I think are the most important to know. Uh, it's not all of them, but they're the ones that I, that I find the most useful. So ergonomics and features. So during our canyoning trip, I filmed quite a bit of footage using the OM-1 and I found the overall experience to be excellent. It was so nice to know that I could film a high quality video with increased dynamic range in a place as wild as this and not have to worry about water. So I kept the 12 to 40 mil f2.8 Pro on most of the time and my mate Matt filmed the BTS using the M1 Mark III and the 12 to 100. So as with the M1 Mark II and III uh, being so light, it's a little tricky filming with such uh, a light camera and lens setup because normally added weight helps to stabilize it. But luckily the IBIS in this is fantastic uh, and irons out most of the micro jitters. So the M1 X was a bit easier to use because it was heavier, so the stabilization to weight ratio was, uh, was much better. So I think I'm gonna try the, uh, the new battery holder on this and see how we go. 
So for the portrait shoot, James shot all of the BTS using an OM1 with a top handle uh, and a handle strap. So for the portrait shoot, James shot all of the BTS using an OM1 with a top handle and, and a side hand strap. And a small number of clips I shot were just with the OM1 running bare. So using the super control panel is an absolute breeze. I found myself regularly jumping back and forth between the different frame rates during the Canyon trip, 25p and 60p. So inside the video settings, you can also allocate four different resolutions and codecs that will show up in the super control panel once you press OK. It's pretty, pretty fast to change between them, but it would be fantastic if there was an option to map a button to automatically switch between these modes. So let's say 25p pressed to 60p, much like the high frame rate button on Blackmagic cameras, which is a huge feature. It would even be great if you, when you press it, that the camera automatically adjusts the, the shutter speed using a 180 degree rule, but I think that might be pushing it. So we can now turn on a large red border on the LCD and EVF to quickly tell we're recording. So this is a welcome feature as previously the little flashing red dot was challenging to see in certain conditions. I would love if they could use the forward facing focus assist light though as a tally light. So you know when you're recording, when you're filming yourself and standing far away from the camera. Food for thought. So continuing with the screen, we have the same histogram and RGB graph when operating in photo mode. Again, it would be great to have the option to move this and the audio bars, bars to another part of the screen. So there's no reason why the audio bars couldn't run vertically on the left side of the screen, as there's definitely enough room. So the OM1 features two zebra settings for over and under exposure warnings that work well. And I am assuming that these values stand for the IRE level. Having some information here to aid the user would be very much appreciated, particularly for beginners, and it's still relatively easy to blow out your highlights if you aren't careful. Generally is recommended that you adjust your zebra settings to accommodate the scene you're shooting. So having examples in the menu would be very, very handy. Another feature I'd like to see in this camera would be an option for false color. So this is a much safer way for exposing in any scene, I think, uh, particularly if you're going to be exposing for skin tones. Currently, the only way to do this is by using an external monitor like I'm using now. There are a collection of values you can uh, change by using the touch screen, which makes things quick and easy, particularly if you have your left hand on the screen and, and operating like this, it's pretty much near instant. Works a treat. Another little feature of the OM1 contains is that when you press the exposure compensation button here on the top right, it will actually lock the white balance of your scene to whatever it was facing. So this only works in auto white balance, but it's incredibly handy when running and gunning in different locations with changing light and color temperatures. So I can see this is a pretty useful feature when you're shooting weddings, um, and you might be going from inside to outdoors and then you need to change it and lock it straight away. The camera does feature focus peaking, uh, which I've always set to high. I find the lower settings are a little bit too difficult to see on such a small screen, even in the shade. So the standout feature in previous models was using the camera stabilization when filming video. It works amazingly well once you know its quirks and what situation it suits best. So the only one is no different and it's incredibly easy to handhold a locked off shot using either one of the two modes, MIS-1 or MIS-2. So MIS-1 engages the sensor and electronic and MIS-2 is sensor only. You can also adjust the IS level to high, regular or low depending on what you're shooting. So for fast movements that include any sort of panning, I highly recommend you use the low mode. This negates some of the sticking you might see uh, where the IS is so strong that it thinks you didn't mean to move in that direction and holds the image in place. So, but the magic really happens when paired with the 12 100 Pro because it engages dual IS and that thing is rock solid. So for this test, we're going to be testing the, uh, the new, the IVA system of the camera. Uh, I've got the 12 to 40 because that's a lens that a lot of people will have. It doesn't have the dual IS, but we should still get um, some great IBIS in the camera. I do have it set to uh, sensor shift and digital, and I'm just going to do a walking test, and we're going to be at uh, 12 mil. Okay, so filming and walking. Okay. So for the next one, we'll put it on uh, just sensor shift only. Same settings.
bias turned off and going. So sensor shift and digital, and this time we're going to do a bit of a run and action. And walking. And action. But despite the stabilization being so good, I still recommend you practice and refine your gimbal walk technique, as this will limit how much jello you might see in extremities of the picture. OM system has told me that the roll axis stabilization has been improved in the OM1, which should also help. It would be great to see an option to allow horizontal or vertical IBIS settings like those found in the stills option. This would be invaluable for panning and tracking shots where we only want to stabilize in one plane of motion. All right, so this is a vlog test at uh, 12 mil dual IS, just sensor shift only, uh, 12 mil. This is gonna be an amazing vlogging camera, I think. I haven't looked at what the Jell-O looks like uh, on the previous cameras, sometimes there was a fair bit there. Uh, you'll see some in the canyoning uh, video that there will be uh, a little bit of Jell-O, I believe. Again, I haven't looked at it, but uh, by and large, I think the Ibis, especially with the autofocus now on this camera, it's going to be an amazing uh, vlogging camera and it's so nice and small. So another great feature is you can now scrub through your clips using the touch screen when reviewing the LCD. I hope this fantastic feature is also introduced to older cameras via the firmware. On the first pre-production model, I found that the scrubbing feature would occasionally freeze up on clips of around five minutes or more and we couldn't move the playhead. I believe this could be negated by using a faster memory card, but I haven't checked. I'd love to see the option to add markers directly on the clips to easily cut the clips in post-production. We'll just speed things up. All right, one of, if not my biggest gripe towards this camera is that it still has the dreaded micro HDMI port. While these are commonly seen on hybrid uh, mirrorless cameras, they're an absolute nightmare to work with unless you're using a cage with a locking port. So basically a light wind snap them off. Like I would have loved to see at least a mini HDMI port here to really add functionality to the video monitoring and recording, but there really isn't that much space, but who knows. So OM system does include this little port lock and cable holder, which does a fair job assuming you are using a cable that fits inside the holder. My adapter is actually too fat and won't actually reach inside. So I'm hesitant to purchase the Atomos right angle cable as it also looks too shallow to fit inside. Hopefully there comes a 90 degree cable and locking mechanism with a third party cage, but we'll see. So a very welcome feature to the OM1 is the removal of the 30 minute record limit. So many no more stress when filming interviews and events. Uh, when using an SDXC SD card, the camera can now actually record a single file up to a maximum of three hours in length. So it makes post production much cleaner and straightforward. When using an SDHC card, the camera will break up the files into four gig clips like it used to do on the other cameras. On occasion, I've used the OM Share app to operate the camera when filming myself. However, I couldn't get the camera to talk to it, but I have been assured uh, by OM System that this is coming in firmware updates once the camera goes into production. So you shouldn't have an issue. So OM System states you should get 90 minutes of record time out of a battery. However, I found this to be a bit more on the conservative side. As I left the camera to film in Cinema 4K 60 with IBIS turned on and got 55 minutes of filming on a 64 gig card. And that gave me 53 minutes remaining on the battery when that was exhausted. One thing to note is that when the camera seems to feature an inbuilt cooling mechanism that you can actually hear from the moment you turn on the camera. So obviously it's great to have a cooling mechanism when filming in 4K slow motion, but having the option to lower this setting when you can only use the internal um, microphones would be awesome as they pick up some of the noise. 
I mean, it's easily removed in post-production though, and if you use a directional shotgun mic, it's no issue whatsoever. During the test, I found the camera got quite warm to touch. Still, there was never uh, an overheating warning that appeared, nor did the camera stop recording. So this is promising. I'll need to test this in hotter conditions outside my uh, 24 degree office though. In the desert, that might be different. So the camera features auto tracking in all uh, AI modes, which is excellent. However, I didn't get a chance to test this out. Uh, when using touch to track, you'll need to change the autofocus area pointer to on one, which is the box you see exactly um, to see what you're following. This is annoying as there would it'd be better if there was an option to uh, lock your choice within the video only mode. Uh, I don't know why, but maybe in, in firmware it can be fixed. So I did find tracking to be a little finicky at times, but like in photo mode, all you have to do um, is lock on using a smaller focus grid um, and let the subject move around in the entire frame that way. So previous cameras featured a great little option to create time-lapse video within the camera in addition to the raw shots you captured from the sequence. But we now have an exposure smoothing option that aims to account for the flickering of luminous changes in the output of video. Again, I'm yet to try this out, but keen to see how effective it is. I prefer to process my time-lapse straight in Resolve, but I'm almost always outputting that internal video for reference, so to see if there was a glaring mistake. It's also great to see how long your clip will be, but at this stage, the highest frame rate you can output is uh, 30p. It would be great to have a 25p option. So with the power of the new processor and the push for computational technology, I had a small hope that OM system would have given us an electronic uh, ND filter like that found in the FX6. I know this was a little far-fetched, but to do away with the physical ND filter would have played to the camera's strengths uh, of carrying as little as possible. Perhaps we might see this in the next iteration um, that's released. Our scratch audio sounds decent and the internal pickups don't seem to run too hot. That being said, I still turn the internal mics to a negative 10 and boost the gain on my shotgun or wireless microphone to avoid the noise floor. However, I am at uh, negative nine at the moment and uh, I am on the high uh, plus 20 dB on my Rode VideoMic Pro. All right, resolutions. OM system have given us three picture modes to choose from. The first being mode one, which is H.264, a very common compressed codec in the form of long GOP. So OM system has changed the name of to long GOP instead of the previous IPB, but they're essentially the same thing. So when using this mode, it is essential to note that while the uh, chroma subsampling is 420, you are actually working in 8-bit. So it's pretty much the same as what the M1 Mark III and the M1 X did internally, uh, aside from the high frame rates. So, so in 4K, you also have the option to shoot in Full HD 29.97, 25p and 23.98 using all intra, um, which should, should give you fewer artifacts, but the results are probably negligible. Okay, mode two, H.265. So we now have beautiful 10-bit 420 footage when shooting the highly compressed H.265 long GOP codec in Cinema 4K, Ultra HD, and Full HD up to a maximum frame rate of 59.94p. Interestingly though, the live view labels this as 60p, but after looking through the specs and uh, looking through the um, frame rate menu, uh, it is actually 59.94p, no no why with the option to also use 50p, 29.97, 25, 24, and 23.97. I mean, this is not that important for most solo shooters, but it is something to keep in mind if uh, a client asks for perfect 60p footage and you are shooting in 59.9. H.265 theoretically being even more compressed than H.264 means we should get the same image quality, but with far smaller image sizes. And indeed, we shot an entire day of footage using the highest quality settings on 128 gig card. And we used about half that. So I must point out that you cannot currently record to both cards simultaneously. Um, I'd love to see this as an option in firmware upgrades, even if we were forced to use 300 megabits a second cards. So a great thing to note here is that because the maximum bit rate is 152 megabits a second, and the codex is so compressed, you can safely use 170 meg megabits a second SD cards which are far cheaper than the 300 megabits cards you need for the ultra high speed stills. I'm actually gonna make a video I think on the best settings and accessories for the OEM one soon. So hit that notification bell if you're into that. Again, we have all intra compression option here when shooting in full HD, uh, but this time we have 59.94, 50, 29.97, 25p and 23.98 option in 10 bit. 
So there really is no need to shoot anything but mode 2, I think, uh, unless you're running an older computer that cannot easily decode H.265 footage. As I'm running a top spec uh, M1X MacBook Pro, it breezes through the footage. Uh, however, you should definitely check out um, the files on your NLE before purchasing based on um, this feature alone, because you may need to render out a proxy clip or something that will work better with your computer. I might make a, a, a clip available for download if anyone wants to try it on their computer beforehand. Drop us a comment if you'd like that and I can send you one. So there are options to change the playback frame rate of the high frame rate footage within this mode. However, you can only change this for fast motion playback, which I, <laughs> I think is pretty uh, useless. I hope they give us the option to include slow motion playback at 25p. So that when we play the footage back in slow motion on the camera, it shows slow motion. And when we put it on a 25p timeline in DaVinci, it also shows up as slow motion. I do hope that in future firmware updates, we are also given 4K 120 and possibly the option for all intro recording in 4K. I know it's possible because they did it on the GH5. Okay, so mode three, high speed movie. This is the ON1's mode uh, to shoot super high frame rates up to 240 frames a second in H.264 and 200 frames a second in H.265, all in full HD. Uh, if you want 10-bit, uh, you need to use H.265. It's worth noting there's also a hefty crop when shooting in these modes, so you should take this into consideration when you're choosing the lens and your composition. For those looking to squeeze even more out of the camera though, we have the opportunity to record in 12-bit ProRes RAW via the Ninja which is also something I've doubled with in the past in the M1X, but the workflow for me was just, it was a little frustrating because I don't use Final Cut Pro anymore. Having to convert the files into ProRes 444 was just resulting in enormous files. But I am keen to test out using my mate's recorder again, see what the footage looks like, because I have no doubt that it would look absolutely amazing. Okay, so color grading. So there is no denying that having those extra colors from the 10-bit footage is amazing. We now have far less banding in the skies and the highlight roll off is much nicer. Previously when pulling keys on skin tones you would need to be super careful and use 6 vector red presets, but now we can pull keys and isolate them like professional grade footage, I had no trouble at all. But obviously being H.265 there is a limit to everything, so it sure won't replace 12 bit b-roll from my cinema cameras, still we now have the option to actually colour grade creatively on OM footage which is incredible. I found when applying the OM log LUT to the 8-bit footage, uh, it often did strange things to highlights and was almost unusable. But now it actually works beautifully with only minor tweaks needed to get the footage to be pleasing and natural result. I did find it would boost saturation a bit too much on occasion, so that needed to be toned down, and that's on the 10-bit footage. So the camera's inbuilt uh, BT709 monitoring LUT is great for monitoring, but produces a highly saturated and contrast image so use it only for monitoring and not as a representation of what your final image might look like. The only way around this would be for OM system to allow users to upload their own LUTs. The flat profile also looks excellent and is a likely option I will use moving forward for my BTS footage. I would still try and avoid filming with picture profiles turned off as the, the footage looks a little too digital like. It's definitely much nicer in the flat profile. Olympus Ultra HD footage historically was overly sharp uh, which is fine if you're after that, but like many other filmmakers, we would end up slapping on a, a 1 8 or 1 quarter mist filter to give it a bit more of that cinematic look. But the new H.265 footage looks stunning. Even in low light, the noise is controlled well and the sharpness isn't overbearing. You can see some of the BTS here that were shot in low light using the OM-1 and the 17mm f1.2. So even when cranking the ISO to 3200 or more, it's definitely usable. And after applying some noise reduction in post, we have a great image. I'm going to also do a video on basic colour grading, I think, with the log footage, so drop us a comment if that's something you're interested in. Alright, who is this camera for? Well, the OM-1 is a mighty little beast, and at 3299 it certainly is well priced for the tech you get inside and the reliability in all weather conditions. But it could be at the steeper end for many beginners who might be better suited to OM-1 Mark III to hone their skills. It's clear though that this camera is firmly designed and marketed towards pro adventure and outdoor content creators who operate solo, fast, and for those people who are yearn for a camera that you never have to worry about, no matter the situation. For me though, when filming commercial adventure content, I most certainly will have this strap to the Peak Design clip on my strap, with probably the 12 to 100 f4 attached. That way I can film 99% of the content with only one camera. 
when hefty gear is required, I likely use this as my telephoto camera lens um, or when it's bucketing rain and, and I need something weather sealed. Honestly, I think I can almost do away with my gimbal for many of my shots as the Ibis is so good. Uh, I will need to do a bit more practice uh, and see if there's any different quirks with the Ibis uh, in those situations. Also, remember to check the description below for links for a list of the accessories that I'm currently using on this camera. If more third-party accessories like a cage um, are released, I'll also do a video on that so I can give my impressions on what um, I think of those. I hope that OM System or a third party also release an underwater housing for this uh, because it would be an absolute weapon underwater. The E1 Mark II was already a, such a great camera underwater, but uh, this would be even better. Okay, so in closing, while the nitpickers out there might throw specs and feature comparisons to, to other brands and say, well, so and so had this, these features years ago, it's old technology. Well, they must also remember that a great deal of the technology found in those cameras was pioneered by Olympus. So remember Canon didn't even have IBIS in their uh, mirrorless cameras until a few years ago. It's one of those never ending cycles of technological advancements that really can never please everyone. But honestly for me in my line of work, this camera ticks, well, all the boxes. I'm confident it can take my work to the next level as well because it's just so damn good. Like Olympus have always been known to push the limits and implement new tech but not at the expense of reliability or quality control. They release something that is refined and has been perfected. So I think that OM System has done well to stay true to the Olympus roots with um, the design of this. Uh, the feature and the speeds should satisfy many users, particularly those who, uh, who frost the outdoors and operate in run and gun situations. A bit like me. There are some video features obviously that I would like to see implemented. However, with the Olympus track record to updating firmware uh, with incredibly feature-rich additions, pretty much makes the cameras like new again. Uh, I'm confident we'll see uh, this camera evolve into something even better. So on a final closing note, I urge anyone in the adventure outdoors and travel realm to go out, pick up one of these cameras and actually give it a go. Whether it's in the shop, borrow one from a friend, it's all well and good to see like, me talking about it and seeing numbers on paper, but when you're at the end of a grueling 10 hour hike in the wilderness, and you bucket in rain and you spot the perfect composition over in the corner, I guarantee you will fall in love with what this camera can actually do and can actually enable you to do. It gives you freedom to create. And as always, thank you so much for sticking with me. This was probably the most extended and most in-depth I've ever gone uh, in a review and it took me a bloody long time to put together. So I would wholeheartedly love if you could hit that thumbs up button so that others out there can learn more about this great camera. And if you'd like to see more, um, I wouldn't say no to a cheeky little subscribe. But on that note, I will see you in the next one. Peace.